We saw right from the very beginning, we went directly to the Hans Christian Andersen tale, and we saw a very modern story, a very contemporary story about a young girl who feels displaced, doesn't feel like she belongs, and um, she goes on an epic journey, really, of self-discovery to break down the barriers and walls between herself and the other, which in this case is the human world. And um, I think what's what's beautiful about that is that, you know, I think we can all relate. Don't you feel that way, John? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I instantly, uh, you know, associated with this outsider mm -hmm. thing. I mean, that was, that to me, was very, very important. I, I, no question. And then you mm -hmm. saw that border thing as, as the, yeah. the, the thing that caught you. I mean, we were, when we were making this, it was, you know, the, we feel the world become more divided and more divisive in a way. And um, it was this wonderful antidote the entire time about not being afraid of what's on the other side of the border or other side of the wall, not being afraid of someone different than you. And um, in this wonderful reminder that we're really um, all one. And learning how to be tolerant and listen to the other so we can somewhat understand you know, their, their plights. Exactly. It's very important to us to find, um, as people who live in this world and are contemporary, we want to. Know, we had to find a way in. Yeah, and yeah, that's the yeah. most important thing for yeah, us. No how does it, what film? Exactly. How does it relate to an actual audience today? And that's how we saw it. And us in our world today. Exactly. So that's. This is the most challenging film I know we've ever done. I mean, I don't think we could have done this film if we hadn't done all the movies up to this point. Um, because, uh, you know, listen, when they said you're going to do an underwater musical, we thought, well, how do we do that? <laughs> How do you do that? How do you begin? Um, uh, because everything is, listen, we were in a blue screen stage. You, there were literally n no sets, um, pieces and things like that, but, and, and a few props that were used, but everything had to be added digitally. But we had this incredible group of people and we prepped like crazy. We spent years prepping for this film. We started with storyboards. We went moved directly into um, animatics and then pre-visualization so we could almost create like a little mini movie where we would have where the actor would be in in the in space in the water and how we would have the camera moving and then that was translated to our camera team and also our um our of, of course our stunt team so they would know where to move every, everyone so it was it, it was it was daunting and I we mean, all had to learn we all had to teach ourselves and and collaborate mm -hmm. and to try to find, and we'd have these methodology meetings. We yes. all we kept getting together in groups trying yes. to figure how out how do we do it. And but I can say one, I have two words that got <laughs> us through, and it's Rob Marshall. Oh, John. I mean, no, seriously. It, without that patience, I mean, I always thought I was patient, but no. <laughs> but that patience and that kind of being able to feed it has to feed through one voice in the end of the day, and it can't look technical as we knew we could yeah. never so you just it, it is such a balancing act between all these different factions and without that vision mm -hmm. and thank god you're so musical though because it not only in terms of that it is a musical but the way that the stunt people had to move and 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 flow and the actors it, it, the whole thing was a musical ex ex exercise yeah you're absolutely right john i mean it was definitely all had to be choreographed in advance. That was the that was the most important thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't know how to even begin. Mm. Yeah, Under the Sea was the most complicated production number we've ever done um, because there's one live actor and everything else is digital <laughs> created. And so we we once again we thought, how do we begin? And I remember thinking about Fantasia. I, I thought of Walt Disney, and I I remembered when he did Fantasia, the Nutcracker Sweet se sequence. Um, was he used the ballet russe as a template, those, their bodies, to help him create the dancing flowers or the snowflakes or the mushrooms or whatever. And so I thought we should work with a company. And so we brought the Alvin Ailey company over uh, to London to work with them to create this musical number on. And we asked them to actually replicate these different sea creatures and how they moved. And so that the so that our CGI artists would have a chance to have a body to work from and to and and to mold from, and it was uh, it was it was insanity in a way. But uh, but I will say, at the end of the day, 
having that company, that beautiful company, um, there with us, and 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 being able to work, you know, uh, with with actual dancers and use them was was really was was really the key. I think that was the key uh, to getting into this and figuring it out. They did enliven the whole process. Yeah. When they arrived, it was it was just it was a real injection of it, spirit and exactly. just what we wanted well, to create. You have to start with something you can actually control. So we thought you have to at least start with something that's that's tangible, like a dancer. And because we're both choreographers and dancers ourselves, um, back in the day, um, <laughs> we um, we we really needed to physicalize it and understand how we were going to do it. And so then we work with that plus pre-visualization pre plus um, storyboards and all of that to mold this massive production number. And they're all they're all real fish. All, all the fish yes. in the yeah, movie they're are all, actual, They're all real sea creatures. Yeah. And, we, and when we were de debating and deciding which ones to use, we looked for ones that lent themselves to dance. Yeah. Like those beautiful feather starfish that just look like they almost uh, you a know, costume. They almost yeah. look like they're in a carnival, in, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And or or even like just uh, John, like the, even the, just the sea turtles, or you know, or the slugs, the, or the little lim <laughs> the limpets. Yeah, they yeah, they had yeah. these little hats on. That we thought, well, the, so we were looking for actual creatures that we thought we could actually choreograph on and and give us a sort of a whole array of everything that's under the sea. We started with you know this um, uh, uh, amazingly beloved. Um, animated film uh, that's uh, you know has incredible bones but we realized this need to be reimagined as a live action film and we knew one of the major things we had to do was take the character of Eric and flesh that character out and understand his trajectory his story his journey what does he want um, so we we actually created an entire story for him um, he has a mother they, there's a similar um, feeling of being displaced um, that his parents doesn't understand him, um, so that these two kindred spirits, Ariel and Prince Eric, find each other. That was a, that's a big part of it, and that was a uh, that was definitely one of the big elements of starting to flesh out the story mm -hmm. in a Romeo and Juliet kind of way. Exactly, right, Romeo saying. and Juliet really helped us, didn't it, yeah, John? It, did. it really did. It did, and because we and we wanted her to fall in love with him. Not just because he was a beautiful man, right? But for for what he he represented and the the dilemmas he was going through. Exactly. And she hears his passion before she sees him on the boat. And it was very important. She for has us. more substance than that, you know. She she's looking for something that she can connect to in the world. She finds someone who's pat, compassionate and kind and 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 thoughtful and adventurous like her, and 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 feels kind of trapped in their world mm -hmm. like she does. So it was, it, it, it really was, that became sort of the center. And we sort of worked from that. But you know, anytime you take a, 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 a piece and move it into a different genre, so now we're in a live action world, mm -hmm. it has to be more real, it has to be more fully realized. And since the story of, of the father and daughter, mm -hmm. Triton and Ariel, was so important to the story, we wanted to create an, a, a parallel story between Eric and his mother, exactly. who is the queen, and the prime minister. We made Grimsby a more um, elevated, a more character. serious character. Yeah, yeah, someone exactly. who figures into this um, royal family. I mean, that, you know, there are many things that work in the animated film that just would never work on a, in a live action piece. But that—that's why they live separately and together. They're sort of mm. like this wonderful sort of pair, companion yeah, pieces. companion yes. pieces, exactly.